greetings to all of you in the room. Uh, my name is Steve Collins. I'm coming to you from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And my understanding is I'm to begin with uh, prayer and before we start the message. So uh, yeah, if you're all with me there in the room, I will begin with uh, asking uh, our Creator's favor on the message today. Almighty Creator, our Father in Heaven, the glory of all your people, of Israel and all the world, we come before you during this Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot period of time. We ask you that it would be a meaningful and a joyous festival there in Prescott, Arizona. We ask you for your favor and blessing on the hearing and the speaking of the message today, that it will build faith, that it will strengthen the conviction of people in you as the creator and your word as the real divine inspired word for us. And we ask this all in the name of Yeshua, your son. Amen. And, well, greetings and shalom to all of you. I'd like to express my thanks to Mike Bacon and all others who have sponsored this year's observance of the, the Feast of Tabernacles, the festival commanded to the ancient Israelite tribes in Leviticus 23, and it's also called Sukkot, and we're observing it today. As I think most there know, I'm the author of a series of four books examining the migrations and history of the ten tribes of Israel. For those of you who were here last year, I gave a message about the ancient Israelite empire of Parthia which is the third book in my series on Israelite history. Today I'll be giving a message about my second book in the series, which is called Israel's Lost Empires. After learning about history from the perspective of the ten tribes of Israel, which is what you learn when you read my books, you can have faith in the Bible, not in spite of the historical record, but because of it. As you can see, there's complete union between the biblical narratives and what the secular history has to say. And by the way, I'm completely comfortable with the usage of the divine names in either English or the Hebrew usages, and I will probably interchange them back and forth some in my message. My book, Israel's Lost Empires, covers a lot of historical ground. It begins by presenting evidence that the United Kingdom of ancient Israel under David and Solomon was a global world power, not some backward shepherd kingdom. It is vital to establish the original power and size of the kingdom of, of the Israelites before discussing its subsequent lost empires that were formed after the tribes were exiled. My book then examines the many different paths that the Israelite tribes took as they exited the promised land in their exile. The Bible promised they would be widely scattered among the nations, and that came to pass. My book then presents evidence about two specific Israelite empires which reigned for many centuries before they were overthrown. Both of these empires were founded long before the Parthian Empire, which I discussed last year, came into existence. One of the empires I'll mention today was dying out just as Parthia rose to power, and the other continued alongside of Parthia and was a powerful ally of it. And this message will only have time to give the high points of the topics in my book. I'd like to start with three misconceptions, which should be the second slide appearing on the screen overhead, that most people have about the ten tribes. The first misconception is the tribes all went into captivity when Israel fell about 721 B.C. The second misconception is that the ten tribes became lost nomads who could no longer be identified. The last one is that God or Yahweh permanently forsook them. All these assumptions are completely false based on both biblical and secular evidence. Now, in Isaiah 1, Yahweh said he would punish Israel, that means the ten tribes, by expelling all of them from their promised land. This was God's pronouncement of judgment upon them for the accumulated sins they had. However, in verse 10 of Hosea 1, God also promised to so vastly increase the population of the ten tribes after they were removed from the promised land, that their numbers would become like the sand of the sea. So they were to be vastly expanded in population after Yahweh sent them into exile. Hosea 1 is a very important chapter. It actually shows there are two covenants between God and the tribes of Israel. While uh, God was driving them off the land for their sins, uh, which disaffirmed the punishments of the covenant made between Yahweh and Israel via Moses, his promise to vastly increase their numbers after he exiled them affirmed a blessing of the covenant made between Yahweh and Abraham regarding Abraham's birthright descendants. The blessings and cursings of the covenant with Moses were conditional on the tribe's obedience to the divine commandments, but the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant were unconditional 
that was based on Abraham's obedience and faith. Now, the Abrahamic covenant included many blessings, which I'll just run through very quickly on the screen here. In Genesis 13, 15 to 16, it included, again, that huge number of descendants, which Hosea 1, 10 referred to. Genesis 17, verses 4 and 6, refers to the fact that Abraham would be the father of many nations, not just one, and that he would also father dynasties of kings. In uh, Genesis 22:17, his descendants are again promised to be as numerous as the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea, which again harkens right back to Hosea 1:10's prophecy later on. And also that the nations descended from Abraham would possess the gates of their enemies, key choke points in the geography of the earth. It also included a promise that Abraham's birthright descendants would bear the name of Isaac upon them. And that we find in Genesis 21:12, which is a very important clue for locating Abraham's birthright descendants throughout history. It says, in Isaac will your seed be called or be named. So we should expect that name of Isaac to follow the birthright descendants. This is affirmed twice in the New Testament. I won't dwell time on it, but uh, on the screen you should see Hebrews 11:18 and Romans 9, verses 7 to 8. The writers of those books uh, affirmed that that was a covenant that God was still going to be implementing in New Testament times. Now, the covenant between uh, God and Abraham was passed down to Isaac, then to Jacob, who was renamed Israel, and in Genesis 48, to the sons of Joseph, that's Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, let's examine both scriptural and secular evidence to confirm that Hosea's prophecy came to pass after the tribe's exile from the land. In Jeremiah 3, is a chapter which was written about a century after Samaria fell. So this is when the ten tribes are gone. Judah, at least a remnant of it, is still there around Jerusalem. But Yahweh sent Jeremiah with a message to both Israel and to Judah at that time, showing that Yahweh had clearly not forsaken Israel because he was giving Jeremiah a message to send to them, even after their removal from the Promised Land. Now in verses 11 to 12, of Jeremiah 3, it says, this is quoting God, saying, backsliding Israel has justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, return, backsliding Israel, I am merciful, and I will not keep my anger forever. Now, I'm coming back to this, so if you want to keep your finger there, if you're going through a Bible, but look at Jeremiah 51.5, which was written perhaps 125 years after Samaria fell. There, Yahweh flatly declares, Israel has not been forsaken. That's referring to the ten tribes of Israel. It says, Israel has not been forsaken, nor Judah, of the Lord of hosts. So, so those saying that God forsook the ten tribes when he expelled them from the Holy Lands have totally overlooked this verse. Over a century after their expulsion from the Holy Land, Yahweh is categorically declaring he has not forsaken the ten tribes. He couldn't forsake them. The covenant he made with Abraham was eternally binding, and it was unconditional. And that was what was referred to in Hosea 1.10, where, where God was telling them, I'm still going to be keeping that covenant of Abraham with you, even in exile. So the covenant with Abraham was in effect long before the covenant with Moses was It was, was important ever made. to the writer that God had chosen a pure race, and that he had done this from the earliest times, and that this race had to remain pure. These would be the Jewish people in his own time who were to refrain from intermarrying with their neighbors or really to have any contact with their neighbors to maintain purity. For as the texts were translated, it became clear that the Essenes and the Jerusalem priests were not in agreement with one another on fundamental religious issues. Mixing is forbidden because the people are holy and the sons of Aaron are the holy of holies. Nevertheless, as you know, some of the priests and the people are mixing. They are intermarrying and thereby polluting the holy seed. Dead Sea Scroll, number 4Q398.
perpetuation of the race was all important. So important that it seems biblical writers might endorse any means to ensure the survival of the Jewish people. At evidence, but one place is an interesting place. It's an ancient document going back to the year 1320. The Scottish Declaration of Independence. In 1320, in order to remain free from the English control, some 25 Scottish nobles and King Robert the Bruce of Scotland drew up a petition which still today can be viewed at the Register House in Edinburgh. It was drawn up by one Bernard D. Linton, who was Abbot of Aberbothick and Chancellor of Scotland, and it has been described by the Scots as, quote, probably our most precious possession, end quote. It's known as the Declaration of Independence for the Scots, and in it is proof that the Scots were part of those tribes. We have printed that portion of the Scottish Declaration, and we read it to you now. We know, Most Holy Father and Lord, and from the chronicles and books of the ancients, gather that among other illustrious nations, ours to wit, the nation of the Scots, has been distinguished by many honors, which, passing from the greater Scythia through the Mediterranean Sea and pillars of Hercules, and sojourning in Spain among the most savage tribes, through a long course of time, could nowhere be subjugated by any people, however barbarous. And coming thence 1,200 years after the outgoing of the people of Israel, they by many victories and infinite toil acquired for themselves the possession of the West, which they now hold. In their kingdom, 113 kings of their own royal stock, no stranger intervening, have reigned. End of quote. Notice they said in this declaration, about the outgoing of the people of Israel. In other words, they are some of those Israelite people. It's quite a story when you start looking into it, and we tell that story in a DVD called Roots, From Abraham to America. And we'll send it to you free of charge if you order it at Scriptures for America, Post Office Box 766, Laporte, Colorado, 80535. You may recall from the famous movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner that Moses wore a distinctive colored robe to signify his seed line as being of the house of Levi, the tribe of Levi. The movie romanticizes this, however, the practice of tribal seed line distinction by use of colors and lines upon clothing and robes was very real. And this practice would be adhered to even as the tribes of Israel who left Samaria migrated into Europe. And here are some examples of the practice by the Judean family clothing which denote family seed lines. In other words, of the tribe of Judah. And here are European and Britannic examples of clothing which denote family seed lines and or tribes or clans, and it's called tartan. Tartan has roots which go back much farther than most people are aware of. And it spanned the families of the European tribes. And this would also later translate into family crests and symbols of heraldry of nobility. M was in effect long before the covenant with Moses was ever made. So the covenant with Abraham was not affected by what happened under the terms of the covenant with Moses. Now Yahweh still had promised to keep about Abraham's descendants, and he always keeps his promises. Those who say that he forsook the Israelites are actually asserting that Yahweh reneged on his covenant with Abraham, which he couldn't possibly do. Back in Jeremiah 3, verse 14, Yahweh says to Israel and Judah, I am married to you, 
So Yahweh refers to his re relationship with Israel and Judah as a covenant relationship, which it was. Now, there's more in Jeremiah yet, yeah, in this chapter 3. If all Israelites were had gone into captivity in Assyria, that's to the east of the Old Promised Land in Mesopotamia, Yahweh would have said in Jeremiah 3.12, proclaim this message toward the east, Jeremiah. But the Creator knew that the main body of Israelites were not in Assyria. He knew they were north of Jerusalem, and he said, proclaim this message to the north. And this is one of the factors of ancient history that people have overlooked in following the Ten Tribes. If you draw a line north of Jerusalem, and you come to the Black Sea region of uh, the people that were called the Sake Scythians, uh, you'll see that straight north up by the Black Sea, and we'll be talking a great deal about them later. But now Daniel 7 also confirms that Daniel knew that by his lifetime the Ten Tribes had been widely scattered, many locations throughout the world. Is In his prayer in Daniel 9, where he's confessing the sins of his people, both of Israel and Judah, he says in verse 7, he refers to all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries, plural, where you have driven them. So Daniel knew that the ten tribes had been driven into many different countries by the time of his life, and that some of them still live very near Daniel. Those are the ones that would have been taken captive by Assyria to the cities of the Medes by the Assyrians, but later on the Persian Empire replaced them, of course. But Daniel was still living in the cities of the Medes of the Medo-Persian Empire at that time. But the Israelites that were afar off in other locations were the ones that didn't go into an Assyrian captivity, which we'll talk more about later. They kept control of their destiny, even though they were exiled. But in both Jeremiah and Daniel's time, the whereabouts of the ten tribes was still known to prophets and people of God. Uh, Genesis 49 includes specific prophecies about each one of the tribes in the latter days, which I believe is our time that we're living in right now. But it clearly shows that whatever you think the latter days are, all of the tribes of Israel are going to be alive and on the earth during that time because the book of Genesis gives us clues for locating them. And my book follow, books follow those clues. Now, Ezekiel 37 also has a prophecy regarding the two sticks about the two houses of Israel and Judah which will remain separate throughout history and not be reunited until the Messianic Age begins. Revelation 7 includes a prophecy about a mysterious group called the 144,000. But these are all Israelites from the, each of the tribes of Israel on earth at the end of the age. So the Bible in several places prophesies that the ten tribes of Israel absolutely must be found among the nations in the latter days. If they died out, the Bible has failed, and we're wasting our time. But as my books point out, you can trace them very easily and see that uh, God has kept his promises about them throughout history and today. Now let's look at some secular sources that also give information on where the Israelites went after their empire fell under David Solomon. Josephus, the famous Jewish writer of the first century A.D., had, I believe, Hosea 1 in mind when he wrote regarding the ten tribes of Israel and that should be up on the screen, giving the uh, appropriate part of his book where he writes this. Josephus wrote, There are but two tribes in Asia and Europe subject to the Romans. While the ten tribes are beyond Euphrates till now, and are an immense multitude, not to be estimated by numbers. So that shows that the prophecy of Hosea 1.10 had already been fulfilled and was being fulfilled by the time of Josephus' lifetime, but they were too big to count. Uh, Josephus confirmed the blessing of great population increases uh, that were part of that Abrahamic covenant. So as of the first century A.D., when our Savior lived, the ten tribes of Israel were not lost. Educated Jews such as Josephus, Josephus knew exactly who they were and where they were. Also in Matthew 10, verses 5 to 6, Yeshua himself said he was sending the apostles to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the ten tribes. Yeshua's assignment didn't seem to surprise any of them at all. They, they knew the addresses uh, to which they were being sent. It was common knowledge at that time. Now, one reason people can't find the Ten Tribes of Israel in history is they incorrectly use a minimalist approach, assuming that all they're going to find are scattered little remnants. 
Well, that's quite wrong. Hosea 1 tells us that we must use a maximalist approach for finding the ten tribes. We have to look for them among the large nations of the earth who will be enjoying the specific Abrahamic covenant blessings. There was a man called Ortelius, who was a 16th century geographer in Europe. He wrote that the Israelites of the ten tribes migrated to the Caucasus mountain region and that they took the name Gothi. Later on, that was spelled by the Romans as Goths, who later on became known as Visigoths and Ostrogoths, but these people had an Israelite origin. Eldad, who was a medieval Jewish writer, wrote, Many of the Israelites did not go into captivity. Now that's referring to the Assyrian captivity. But it says they evaded the calamity, going off with their flocks, and that the chief or prince whom they appointed could muster 120,000 horsemen and 100,000 uh, foot soldiers. So with 220,000 armed men escorting this band of Israelites that was migrating out of the Old Promised Land and heading north to the Caucasus Mountains, the entire band had to number two or three million when you include all the numbers of wives, children, the elderly, etc. So the concept that the ten tribes of Israel were lost is a fairly recent concept. Even in medieval times, people knew the Israelites had fled north to the Caucasus Mountains to evade the Assyrian captivity. Now, under King David and Solomon, Israel was a world power in the ancient times. Uh, this has been lost track of because King David and Solomon's history is so old to our perspective, they were ancient history at the time the Roman Empire was on earth. Uh, remember the kings David and Solomon were allied to the Phoenicians of Tyre and Sidon. The Bible records that they practically merged their societies uh, with, with the alliance under King Hiram, and they merged their navy fleets into one entity. Now, secular history tells us that the Phoenician Empire was the dominant empire on earth from around 1000 to approximately 700 B.C., now, that happens to also be the exact period of time from, the, from Kings David and Solomon, around 1000 B.C., to uh, just after the Israelites fled that region. So the real power of the Phoenician Empire was the Israelites at that particular time. The, the small city-states of Tyre and Sidon reverted to a much smaller status in the world after the Israelites left. Now, there's much evidence in my books that the Israelites were present in ancient North America. They had a 20-acre temple site to Baal and other pagan deities in New England. This is Maybe some of you have seen the program called America's Stonehenge on cable TV, which just shows the foundations of the buildings that are, that that's all that's left now. Because the colonists, when they came to the New World from Europe, dismantled them because they needed those stoneworks to build their own structures. Uh, a trilingual artifact, much like the Rosetta Stone, dating to about 800 to 600 B.C., was found near Davenport, Iowa, up in my area of the Midwest. It had ancient Egyptian and Semitic inscriptions on it, showing parallel accounts in different languages. The uh, Israelites were also present in South America, uh, as the Phoenicians were known to be extremely good mariners and sailed all over the world, far more than we give them credit for now. One nation in South America was known as the Island of Iron by the Hebrews and the Phoenicians. Now, for those of you who know Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word for iron is barzel. We don't have the vowels, but the consonants were B-R-Z-L. Can you think of a nation in South America today that has those con consonants? Well, that's Brazil. And Brazil is still an iron ore exporting region. And Brazil, although people do not realize it, is still known by the Hebrew name given to it during the times of David and Solomon, when it was named after iron. Now, Yahweh's followers were here in North America, too. An Ohio River mound builder grave was dug up in 1860, the year the Civil War began, and it had an artifact with the Ten Commandments in ancient Hebrew found in it. Photos of the original artifact and other artifacts found with it are uh, in my books, as I had permission from the museum to reproduce the photographs in it. So it's in that book I'm talking about today. The Ten Commandments were also written in ancient Hebrew on a large slab in the New Mexico desert along a dry riverbed that once flowed into the Rio Grande. I've been there, inspected it, and a wide variety of photos of this incredible artifact and other Hebrew art, uh, inscriptions in that region are in my new book. Now, this artifact has the ancient Paleo-Hebrew script, which would have prevailed about the time of David and Solomon, not the post-captivity script. 
my book cites evidence that it dates to the time of King Solomon. And there's an extensive photo gallery of this artifact at my website, which is www.stephenmcollins.com. Stephen spelled with a V. But there's also an explanation of the uh, uh, Ten Commandments inscription and the other Hebrew inscriptions that have been found in that region at my website. Now, the term Phoenicia was a Greek term given to the allied nations living between Turkey and Egypt along the East Mediterranean. That included Israel, Tyre, Sidon, and then later Judah would have lived there too. The Bible tells us King David's army reached the Euphrates River, which made him a neighbor of Assyria. Did you realize the Bible and secular history record a tremendous secret that King David conquered the Assyrian Empire? First Chronicles 19 describes a great war where the Israelite army was faced by an alliance of many nations. From, it calls them the Syrians and the Mesopotamian kings who came to destroy Israel. It uh, even talks about the Mesopotamian kings being so certain of victory, they set up their seats to watch the battle. Uh, the Mesopotamians were the Assyrians. Assyria ruled Mesopotamia, and all the other Mesopotamian kings would have been their vassals. Well, the Israelites won this war. But keep in mind, David's forces were already at the Euphrates River. So in the, as they were for fleeing, or pursuing the fleeing Assyrians, invading Assyria was just one step across the river. Uh, secular histories record that Assyria was invaded, defeated, and occupied by an invading Semitic army from the West during the reign of King David. Uh, I have the secular sources quoted in my book. Those Semites had to be the Israelites. David wrote of this war in Psalm 83, which, where he mentions a great alliance, including Assyria, which he calls Asher, which fought Israel and helped the children of Lot. Now that First Chronicles 19 war began with a rebellion against Israel by the Ammonites, the children of Lot, who hired Asher in the Mesopotamians in Syria. But I can't linger there. You can get the story about uh, this in the book. The prophet Nathan gave David a message from Yahweh wherein he stated to David, I have made you a great name, like unto the great men that are in the earth. David was one of the dominant kings of the ancient world, not a minor monarch of a shepherd kingdom. He, he belongs up there with Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, and other conquerors. And during the Messianic Age, his true history and the size of his empire will be revealed to all. Now, one part of the answer where all the Israelites went during the exile becomes easy when we realize the kingdom of Israel was the home kingdom of the Phoenician Empire. Israel, then, as what we call the Phoenicians, had many colonies in Europe, Africa, the British Isles, even in North America. My book includes much information from the books of the late Dr. Barry Fell, a Harvard professor, who wrote three books documenting that the Hebrews, Carthaginians, Egyptians, Romans, and even Islamic Arabs were here in North America. The late Dr. Cyrus Gordon, one of the most famous archaeologists ever, wrote a book called Before Columbus, in which he strongly states that the evidence that the Israelites and other ancient cultures were present in North America is overwhelming. He declared one popular artifact called the Bat Creek Stone to be a valid example of an ancient Hebrew inscription in the American Southeast. He notes the Smithsonian Institute first rejected it as Hebrew because they were trying to read it upside down. Uh, Hebrew language coins have also been found in the Ozarks region of the uh, United States. This evidence is described in detail in my book. Now, one very interesting piece of evidence is that the ancient copper mines by Lake Michigan were worked to exhaustion around 1000 B.C. And as Dr. Fell's book points out, there's no evidence where it went. It wasn't it used in, the old, in, in our continent. Now, the Bible gives us the answer, I believe, where it says King David was told, as you remember, that he could not build the temple, but he was allowed to amass all the materials for the temple that Solomon would build. And it says King David amassed copper beyond counting it around 1000 B.C. for the temple of God, the exact time the copper mines of Lake Michigan were mined to exhaustion. It, uh, so this, this copper had to come from outside Israel, as there wasn't enough copper to be mined in, in, uh, in the Promised Land. My book offers the evidence that the Phoenician Israelite Empire constructed special vessels to transport massive quantities of raw ores and materials over the ocean. Dr. Fell even writes of a Phoenician inscription that was dug up off the coast of Maine, saying 
ships of Phoenicia, cargo platform. That was the inscription as evidence that Phoenician ships had regularly scheduled trips across the Atlantic. Now, secular history records that Assyria was very weak for a century uh, during the reign of King David and Solomon and shortly thereafter until a great biblical event occurred which allowed Assyria to recover its strength. Second Chronicles 13.17 tells us about a horrible civil war between Israel and Judah in which 500,000 Israelite soldiers died. We don't even know how many casualties Judah had, but a half a million Israelite men died in that war. This weakened Israel terribly, and they had to pull back their garrison troops from all over their empire. It had to shrink back toward the Promised Land, and this allowed Assyria to recover in a vacuum. Uh, this also explains why Assyria angrily kept invading Israel until it fell. Assyria was actually seeking revenge for Israel's early de defeat and occupation of Assyria. The Israelites controlled Gibraltar for many centuries, one of the gates of the enemy. Now, Spain was an Israelite colony that, uh, called Iberia. Uh, that the consonants there are the consonants of the word Eber, who was the namesake of the Hebrews or Hebrews. The British Isles had Israelite colonies and have had the name Britain on them for 3,000 years, Brit being, of course, the Hebrew word for covenant. So even today in our modern world, the British Isles have the name covenant stamped on them in Hebrew. This information is necessary so you can see that the birthright descendants of Abraham were already world powers by the time of David, so that when they scattered across the face of the earth, it's not illogical at all to see that these numerous people set up new empires of their own. A couple of the clues we'll keep in mind on, in tracing the ten tribes is Phoenicia's empire had that name BRT, uh, which they put on Britain you know, for the covenant. They knew they were the covenant people, and they called themselves that in place names and on their coins. The second clue is Assyrian records tell us the Israelites were called the Beth Sack, or the House of Isaac, known to other people. Amos 7.16 confirms this. In there it refers to uh, the House of Israel, meaning the Ten Tribes, as being the House of Isaac. So it's important to note that even before they scattered from the Promised Land, they were being known by the name of Isaac, which Genesis 21.12 had prophesied. So where did they all go? Well, the, Israel, the Assyrians only claimed about a paltry 27,000 captives when Samaria fell. 2 Kings 17, verses 5 to 6 and 25, shows that the land of Israel had been abandoned by its people. It had reverted to the wild. It talks about lions overrunning the land, and there has to be an awful lot of prey animals for lions to overrun the land, which means there aren't any people there hunting it. It says the king of Assyria went up and down the land of Israel, and he, there's no word that he found anybody anywhere other than the ones who stayed in Samaria. Uh, the Samaria people who stayed in Samaria either were the diehards that wouldn't quit and stayed with uh, the last king of, Assyria, uh, of Israel who died there, or they were like heroic ones who did an Alamo battle and pinned down the Assyrian Empire in its rear while the rest of them migrated northward. We don't know the truth on which it was. But the Israelites numbered about 3 million when they left Egypt out of the Exodus. They certainly had increased their numbers when they entered their promised land. The Bible, in one census, tells, David, tells us David had over 1 million able-bodied men in his army, and of course he wasn't even allowed to include the Levites in the total. So there's a lot of Israelites unaccounted for in the Bible's listing of the tribes who went into captivity. 2 Kings 15.29 indicates that many Israelites went into captivity about 20 years before Samaria fell. These were the tribes of Gilead, which was Reuben, Gad, and a half of the tribe of Manasseh, as well as Naphtali. Those tribes were about a third or so of the Israelites. Then the people of Samaria were only about 27,000 survivors, so that was just a small rear guard. This leaves about two-thirds of the nation's of the tribes of Israel unaccounted for. The Bible simply doesn't say specifically where they went, but it doesn't say they went into an Assyrian captivity, although we do know they all went into exile. Now, remember Daniel said that the ten tribes were very widely scattered among the countries in his lifetime? Well, one part of the answer is easy when we remember that the kingdom of Israel in the Phoenician period was a maritime empire with huge fleets sailing the seas, and Israel had co colonies in several continents. It is known the Phoenicians were able to navigate by the stars, but what about during cloudy and stormy weather? 
I mean, you have to know where you're going if you have a schedule to keep. My books cite a 1910 book, which revealed the answer, that the Phoenicians had an ingenious invention called a water compass. They would place magnetic lodestones in a basin of water and mark them so that they could always know magnetic north. They, in other words, they had compasses in there in a gyroscopically centered way as best as they could do it in a basin of water uh, to always know where magnetic And as the Egyptian reliefs show, the so-called Sea Peoples were armed in much the same way as the native chariot runners. They were not uh, heavily armored. In fact, any kind of armor would have slowed them down and, and probably made them uh, less effective on the battlefield. And so um, they carried small round shields with leather over a wooden frame. And they wore a helmet. Um, I'm not sure whether the helmet was practical or not, but I think it had a good psychological effect on them. But the final fate of the warriors known as the Sea Peoples may never be known. The Egyptians themselves say that they settled some of the remnants in either Egypt itself or in Canaan. And we know that later, Egyptian texts talk about the city of Dor in Israel being a Tejeker city. We know that the Peleset settle down in Canaan. They become the Philistines. With the worst of motives, these sea people had destroyed one world, but obviously they opened up opportunities for people who had never had opportunities before. We get the Israelites and David and Solomon, and the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, which may not have been able to exist unless the mighty kingdoms of the late Bronze Age had been done away with. So the Sea Peoples, in effect, bring about the demise of the old and the rise of the new. The lands of the Bible are squeezed between the Mediterranean Sea and the desert. To the north is Syria and Asia Minor. To the south, Egypt. To the east, the empires of Mesopotamia. This area used to be called the land of Canaan. It's only 70 miles wide, and it's absolutely essential in a strategic position as the sole land bridge between Eurasia and Africa. In times of peace, it was essential for commerce. In wartime, essential for military maneuver. The Israelites controlled most of this land for most of 12 centuries. We're going to find out how they did it, and you are going to learn how to win with the weapons of the Bible. Sometime during the 13th century BCE, they were led out of bondage in Egypt by their leader, Moses. Later, under Joshua, they began the conquest of the land of Canaan. At this time, the Israelites were still nomadic. They were a collection of individual Bronze Age warriors. They fought with a spear and javelin, bows and slings, clubs, many types of axes, swords and shields. These are the classic weapons of the ancient period, but what's important is what they were made of. Now, they still used flint and stone warheads and blades, and these could be extremely sharp, but they had to be short, and they often shattered on impact. The best blades were made of metal. The first metal blades were made of copper, but this is an extremely soft material. But if you take seven parts copper to one part of tin, you get an alloy called bronze. Now, here's a nice new shiny bronze axe head. This was a very much harder material and could take a good edge, but you still had to be careful with it. It was brittle, and it could blunt very easily. And in the Middle East, bronze was often of poor quality because of the rarity of tin, but it made some good weapons. Right, team, it's time we learned how to use these bronze weapons. From around 9000 BCE began the process we call civilization. Settled agricultural states were established and the ownership of land became important for the first time. Defense of the land and the new possibilities for trade led to the creation of the first walled cities and to the formation of the first semi-professional armies. Now, you guys will be armed with short swords or axes, with spears and with shields, 
Come with some basic armor. Basic armor and helmets of bronze or leather. So pick up your shields, follow me. In Sumeria, we find the earliest phalanx formation, with troops trained to fight and march together, to obey orders, and to keep close formation. 1,500 years later, the Canaanites fought in much the same way. These are the troops the Israelites had to face, and these are the tactics they had to learn. Shields! Spears! The Israelites fought with these early armies and learned from them. They centered way as best as they could do it in a basin of water uh, to always know where magnetic north was. So they could keep a schedule and sail even in cloudy, stormy weather. Now back to those Israelites just before the last Assyrian invasion. Put yourself in their position. About a third of the nation has already been taken captive. The prophets are telling you it's over, that the Assyrians are coming and your nation is going to fall. And the handwriting's on the wall. Uh, you either have the choice of staying, going into captivity and becoming a slave with your family for generations, or you could board one of the many, many vessels in the Phoenician Israelite fleet and take your possessions with you and sail to Africa, Europe, or the British Isles and keep your freedom. Which do you think you would do? I'd opt for freedom. Well, many Israelites had the ability to flee by sea to escape the Assyrians, and they did for decades. Spanish archaeological records confirm that many wealthy Israelites came to Spain with their wealth before Assyria defeated Israel. Ancient British and Irish records record large numbers of the tribe of Simon, Simeon and Dan, it names them by name, as arriving in uh, Ireland and Wales about the time Samaria fell. In fact, so many Israelites wanted out, they had to establish an entirely new colony in North Africa. The Israelites called it Kiryat Hadasha. Uh, in Hebrew, this was New City. It grew wealthy, and it had inherited the, all of the Phoenician trade routes in the Atlantic. It possessed immense fleets of, it own, of its own, and it almost destroyed the Rome under its famous general called Hannibal. This is the Hannibal who marched those elephants across the Alps into Italy. Hannibal is really an Israelite name. It's a combination of the word Hananiah and Baal, as the Carthaginians worshipped Baal, the same false god that the Israelites uh, went into idolatry in. Now, we don't know this city as Kiryat Hadasha, uh, its original name, because it was destroyed by the Romans later. And we know it by its Roman name, which is Carthage. So we call them the Car Carthaginians instead of the Kiryathinians. So we know it by its Roman name as an accident of history. But Carthage's language and culture was Hebrew, although they developed later their own script. Its leaders were called the Shofetim, or judges. Its priests were called the Kohanim, or in other words, priests in Hebrew. Now there's a very strange episode in history. Uh, Hannibal was a phenomenally excellent general, and his Carthaginian army had defeated one Roman army after another in Italy. The last Roman army defending Rome had been defeated. And all Hannibal had to do to destroy Rome and take over the Roman Empire and become, make it part of the Carthaginian Empire was to march in and take the city. There was no one to defend it. But he just dithered and dithered and wouldn't give the order to go in and occupy the city. Well, during his dithering, in a, a new Roman empire, uh, another Roman army marched in uh, to offer defense to the city, and it eventually did not fall. And historians have been absolutely mystified, wondering why Hannibal didn't just act in his own interest and take the city. I think Yahweh gave Hannibal a spirit of inaction at that time. And it was God himself who saved Rome from being conquered by an Israelite-led army of Carthaginians. Well, why would he do that? Well, remember, our Creator will always keep his prophecies and his promises. Daniel 2 records a prophecy given in the form of a dream to Nebuchadnezzar about a succession of Gentile world empires. That vision doesn't talk about all the world empires. It's a succession of Gentile world empires. The final one was to be the Roman Empire and its revival through history. You know, the, the Roman Empire was the iron, which is divided into two legs, just as the Roman Empire was divided into a western and an eastern Roman Empire. If Hannibal had taken Rome, Carthage would have ruled the Mediterranean world, and there never would have been a Roman Empire, which means Yahweh's prophecy about Rome would have failed. 
himself intervened to save Rome from an Israelite army so that Rome could grow into the empire that it was prophesied to be in Daniel 2. This is just one example of the fascinating facts about history when you look at it through the Israelite uh, lens that you'll do when you read my books. My books do cover the entire fascinating history of Carthage, including their naval skills, their wars with Rome, their close trade relations with the Mayans in our hemisphere. After all, where do you think those Mayans learned about pyramids and human sacrifice? Well, the Carthaginians lived in North Africa. They knew about the uh, pyramids. The human sacrifice, grisly rites, were part of Baal worship, which was in Carthage, and they brought it over to the Mayans. Carthage also invented a threshing machine, which had geared wheels. The Romans preserved this information. So if, if you can visualize the Carthaginian engineers making even harvesting machines with geared wheels and mechanisms, uh, this perhaps gives an insight into the knowledge which Carthage inherited from the Kingdom of Israel under Solomon. Now, you may have heard of the Antikythera mechanism. There's been a number of cable TV documentaries on this. It's a very advanced geared calculating machine found off the coast of Greece. It was brought up from a shipwreck. The assumptions in those documentaries is that it was built in the Greek uh, sphere of, of, you know, a region up in the uh, area of Greece and Macedonia because it was found there. However, Greece also traded with Carthage. They were enemies for much of the time, but they had trade back and forth. Since Carthage was known to work with geared machines, maybe that Antikytheria or Antikythera mechanism that was brought up from the bottom of the ocean by Greece was invented not by the Greeks, but within the Carthaginian Empire, and it was being brought to Greece as trade goods or as something stolen when the vessel carrying it sank. Now, Carthage, like Phoenicia, controlled Gibraltar, which was one of the gates of their enemies, a promise given to the Israelite descendants of Abraham. That promise was inherited by Carthage. They kept Greece and Rome out of the Atlantic Ocean for many centuries because for centuries Carthage dominated Greece and Rome. Yet it was Carthaginian state policy to not allow any other nation to follow its ships to its secret colonies out in the Atlantic. However, the Greeks knew that Carthage had a monopoly on an extremely rich land somewhere out there in the Atlantic. After all, sailors will have loose lips in port. And so the Greeks learned from Carthaginian sailors, no doubt, some of the details. Well, one of the historians you probably learned about in history was, was uh, Aristotle, the famous Greek historian or writer. He wrote, in the sea outside the Pillars of Hercules, which means the Gibraltar region, so he's talking about out in the Atlantic, he says an island was found by the Carthaginians, the masters of the Western Ocean, a wilderness having navigable rivers, which was many days sailing distance away from those pillars of Hercules. Now, another Greek writer named Diodorus, or Diodorus, I'm not sure the pronunciation of it, wrote, there is a very great island in the vast ocean, many days sail from Libya westward, Libya meaning a term for North Africa. The soil is very fruitful, a great part is mountainous, but much is a plain, watered with several navigable rivers. This is the secret colony that the Carthaginians had. Well, these are obviously describing North America. North America is, has a very mountainous region, but much of it is a central plain, watered with navigable rivers, the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Ohio, and all the rest of them that empty into the Mississippi. So here in the ancient Greek records, we have a very good description of North America as being a Carthaginian colony. Now, Carthaginian coins and inscriptions have been found in Colorado, New York, Georgia, Alabama, Connecticut, Nevada, and other places. It's clear the secret Atlantic colony that gave Carthage its wealth was North America. Well, why isn't that in your history books? Uh, that's a good question, and I think the reason is that uh, there is a god of this world who is the father of lies and does not want the truth about the ten tribes of Israel known to the modern world. He wants their identity kept hidden and secret, not only from them, but all other nations, because if the world knew this history, they would know that there is a living creator who authored the Bible and who keeps his promises and has been doing so all along. It would also open our eyes as to what's happening in prophecy in our world right before us right now. But it's known from secular history that Carthage had many exploration fleets they sent out into the Atlantic, and colonization ones too. One was led by an admiral named Hanno. In my book, I have the evidence that Dr. Barry Fell found a Carthaginian inscription on the American East Coast saying, by this, 
Hanno takes possession, and showing the very Carthaginian inscription uh, that, that dates to that time. Now, the Phoenician and Carthaginian ships were immense. They were far, far bigger than the teeny-weeny little ships that Columbus and the European explorers of his time uh, sailed when they rediscovered North America. The Greeks record the Carthaginians once sent into the Atlantic a fleet filled with 10,000 men and women as colonists. Uh, this is also documented in my books. And When you divide the number of 10,000 by the number of ships that are mentioned, you can see they're, they've got hundreds of colonists on each ship. Now, modern man assumes that ancient man didn't know the world was round. In fact, it was Greece and Rome which were so backward about world geography because the Phoenicians and Carthaginians kept them bottled up in the Mediterranean and refused to allow Greece and Rome access to the rest of the world. Carthage and Israel and Phoenicia, they all knew the world was round because their fleet sailed everywhere. To keep their sailing route secret, the Carthaginian Senate passed a law that any Carthaginian ship that was being followed or spied upon could run the ship aground, if necessary, and lose its cargo, and its owners would be reimbursed by the Carthaginian government to make sure that no Greek, Greek or Roman uh, ship could discover the secret sea routes across the Atlantic. Now, Carthage is regarded as the richest city of the ancient world. The monopoly they had on the wealth came from the New World, which they had they took all of North America's wealth. Now, in the Bible, we see evidence that the people from the Hebrew tradition of the Israelites, the Phoenicians, and Carthaginians knew the world was round. Look at Job 26, 7. It says there, God hung the earth upon nothing. So, in the time of Job, it was understood that the earth was just hanging there as a ball or a sphere in the ether of space. Isaiah 20, or excuse me, Isaiah 40 verse 22 states, God sits upon the circle of the earth. So they understood the world, world was circular, a sphere. Also, you, you've probably seen in ancient maps all these uh, uh, maps of oceans and seas where they have all kinds of sea monsters to scare people. Well, this was part of an ancient Carthaginian disinformation campaign. The Carthaginians spread all these rumors about terrible, horrible monsters out there in the sea to keep the Greeks and Romans too scared to sail on the ocean. If the Carthaginians knew that even today uh, modern man thinks that the ancient world didn't know the world was round, they would roll in their graves laughing because it was basically everyone knew the world was round except for the backward Greeks and Romans who didn't know this because their ships were not allowed out on the oceans because God had kept his promises that the Israelite empires would have the gates of their enemies, which included Gibraltar. Well, Carthage finally fell due to the sins and excesses of Baalism, just as Israel did in biblical times. And my book offers a plausible account of where they went to, its survivors, when it fell. But now let's move on to the second empire of Israel that was founded uh, from by the exiles, and that's the Israelite power of Scythia. Remember Genesis 21:12 had a critical clue for locating the birthright descendants of Abraham in the future. That was the Israelites. It said, in Isaac shall your seed be called. So in history, we can always locate birthright descendants, which are primarily Ephraim and Manasseh, because Yahweh says they will bear the name of Isaac upon them. And we saw that Amos 7.16 showed that was already true by the time they left the Promised Land. Assyrian records included it. And when the Israelites left the Promised Land, most of them neither went into captivity or nor fled via ship. The Israelites were far too num numerous to fit their entire nation into the ships that were fleeing to the colonies. Most of them had to flee overland, abandoning the Promised Land, and these are the ones that migrated to the Caucasus Mountain Black Sea region. These are the ones that Jeremiah 3 was addressed to when God said, "Talk, give this message to Israel, send it to the north, Jeremiah. You, know, you come right to the Black Sea region when uh, you draw a line north of Jerusalem. In 1875, Colonel Gawler, who was an official of the British government of Queen Victoria, wrote a piece that the classical sources uh, placed the fleeing Israelites north of Armenia in the Black Sea. They became known as the Scythians, or the Sake, S-A-C-A-E. A-E is a, is a plural suffix, but S-A-C is the Sac, that's the word Isaac, uh, preserved for us in the English form. Now, the Persian term was Saka. S-A-K-A, -A, which is more like the Yitzhak, which is more like the, the Hebraic form. 
there's another Hebrew kingdom that was founded and named in the Caucasus Mountains when the Israelites got there. It was called Iberia, which was based on the name Eber, just like the Israelite name for ancient Spain. So there was a West Iberia and an East Iberia. One was Spain, one was up in the Caucasus Mountains. The Bible has two scriptures supporting the secular sources which report that many Israelites migrated to the Black Sea. 2 Kings 19.37 is one of them, uh, where Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, was assassinated by his sons. This was soon after the kingdom of Israel fell. They fled to a land where they knew the people would be intensely anti-Assyrian and would shelter them from the Assyrians who were trying to find them. Well, the Bible says they fled to Armenia, up in the Caucasus. They did so because they knew that's where they'd find Israelites, the bitter enemies of the Assyrians, and that they would count on them for shelter. Now, Jeremiah 3.12's message, that Yahweh would send that message via Jeremiah, again, reinforces this. Is that's the second part, which shows they were up in the Black Sea region. So we see that God keeps his promises to Abraham's descendants, and they especially would become many nations with large populations, that those birthright tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh, would be known by the name of Isaac. That was in Genesis 48's blessing ceremony, where you can see that. Now, remember that Yahweh had good words for Israel in Jeremiah 3. He said backsliding Israel has justified herself uh, at that point. So there clearly had to be some revival among these Israelites that went north to the Black Sea. Uh, The Greek writer Herodotus recorded that these Israelites by the Black Sea, who were named after Isaac, the Sake, forbid idols in their land, and they also refused to keep swine. Now, these are prominent aspects of Torah, which you would expect to see only among the tribes of Israel, a commandment against idolatry and a commandment against keeping or eating swine. Now, the the Scythians uh, are mentioned in Colossians 3.11, where Paul lists them as being the opposite, or barbarians. So these, clear, these Scythians were clearly not considered to be a barbarous people. Now the Scythians, or Sake, renamed the rivers flowing into the Black Sea. They named all of them after the tribe of Dan, which had a habit of naming places after their forefather Dan. Uh, before the Israelites got there, these rivers all had Greek names. Uh, but after the Israelites got there, these rivers have, were given names after the tribe of 